All right, uh, next up we have Peter Lovett. Peter is a programmer, son of a programmer, and all three of his sons can program in Python. Let's continue the legacy. Give him a round of applause. Excellent, thank you. And welcome to my talk on, on being Pythonic. Um, I'm just gonna jump straight in. So uh, a little bit about me. I've been a programmer for a long time. Um, I run my own company called Plus Plus and I run training courses in C, C++, Perl, Python, Java, Ruby, SQL, XML, um, etc. Um, this, this talk is about, uh, about being Pythonic and I would want to make the point that I'm not the final arbiter on what Pythonic is, but I want to ask you some questions and I want to uh, get your brains thinking about what makes good Python. I've got two apologies to make. Um, firstly, there was a, uh, um, a little mix-up in the printing of the schedule, and this, this talk was originally called Design Patterns in Python, but I've actually expanded it and covered some more ground. Um, the uh, the, the, uh, the organisers asked me to do this. So I'm going to be moving through a number of different things and also looking at design patterns but it's all around Python, so I think you'll enjoy it and learn a few things. If you haven't learned anything by the end of the time, uh, please come and uh, hassle me. The, <laughs> the second apology I want to make, which is not an apology, and I liked Caleb's talk earlier, that uh, I'm running on Windows, and um, I'm doing that for a few reasons. One, a lot of my clients use Windows, and um, corporates use Windows, and if I'm, on, um, if I'm gonna be doing Python, I've gotta make sure it works on Windows, hence I'm on Windows. I do know Nix as well. So Pythonic, what is it? Pythonic is a noun that, according to Wikipedia, means uses Python idioms well, that is natural or shows fluency in the language, and conforms with Python's minimalist philosophy and emphasis on readability. And uh, everything that I'm gonna be looking at for the next 45 minutes covers, uh, covers that ground. Oh, oh, there's a Python, um, which I just wanted to throw in there to remind you that Pythons in Australia are safe, they're non-venomous, they're not dangerous. Um, apparently overseas there are some bigger ones that'll do you some harm, but in Australia that's, uh, that's the third son, by the way, who's not here. I'm very fortunate to have the older two here. Um, for me, Pythonic means readable, logical, and sensible. And so that's what I want to uh, challenge you with. Let's do some code that's readable, logical, sensible. Uh, take a second off and say, be kind. I guess this is also what Pythonic means to me. <laughs> Pythonic means be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. <sighs> for some of us, it's because we've got a Java background. <laughs> for some of us, it's C++. <laughs> some of you come from Perl. So an outline of what I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna cover Python idioms, patterns in the language, program design issues about being Pythonic, and then we will look at some design patterns as well. So let's do this. Now I'm also going to be brave, so please be kind, because I'm going to be doing a lot of code. Python is about code. Oh, I didn't mean to have all that. Python is about code. And we're all programmers, so I want to do some code. I'm go I've got a list of numbers there, and I'm going to calculate the average. And the average of those numbers is... Is that too hard? Let's make that a three for you. <laughs> <laughs> is that better? <laughs> calculate the... I'm going to make it hard for you. It's, I know it's after lunch. And of course, the answer to that is there is no average function. So the options to start with are find out what functions you've got. <laughs> Average is surprisingly not one of them. Um, your options from here is to go to 3.4, which has the statistics package, which has average, or jump on over to NumPy and use NumPy, one of NumPy's array of different um, uh, multitudes of different means, NAND means, etc. Uh, I'm often at a client where I'm actually not allowed to bring stuff in. I'm stuck with the version of Python that they've got, and I can't bring extra modules in, so I've just got to make do with what I've got. Generally, the batteries are included, unquote, but um, Python doesn't have an average function. So, we're programmers, let's do some programming. Let's go and write an average function. It'll take a list. I'll need a total. 
I'll need an index, a counter. Why is it I? Side, side question. Why do we use I for our integer? <laughs> From Fortran, because this is for the Fortran programmers, God is real. <laughs> Keep on looping while I is less than the len of A. And uh, total gets added to by the ith element. And then at the end, I'll have to go and return total divided by len. Good? And when I go and run that, I see that I should have paid more attention to Caleb's talk about Scython. And um, this is very slow. <laughs> I have no idea what the problem is. But if I Scythonized it, it would certainly run faster. <laughs> yeah, Scython. So um, I'm a C programmer, so I'll increment I. Question, syntax error, uh, runtime error, logic error. Syntax error? Let's check. No. <laughs> It's the positive of the positive of I. I actually, I'm just noticing that's not quite as big. This was for uh, Carrie Ann, who I don't know if she's here, but um, you here? No? Um, Notepad++, which is just a glory in Windows, control plus, control minus, gives you that zoom that she desperately wanted. Of course, plus plus I is the positive of the positive of I, and that's not actually doing anything. I'm actually quite distressed that Python doesn't have a plus plus operator because I named my company plus plus. <laughs> so I'm now going to have to go and rename my company to plus equals one. And it just doesn't have that same je ne sais quoi. Pardon my French. Now, I had originally written this for three, but let me make that two. And the average is two which I think is, given what I had, the uh, excess that I had for lunch seems about right. Trap for, uh, trap for players. We've got integer division here. So readable, logical, sensible. I could make that just a dot. Not obvious enough. Needs to be more obvious. Maybe that. Maybe I should start being a bit more future-minded and jump on over to the future and import the new division behavior. Would be a nice idea, nice, nice twist. Or maybe I could use a float function. Any of those three would solve that problem and we have a result. <sighs> Good. How many decimal places? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Why 11, anyone? Floating point numbers in Python have how many decimal places in them? <laughs> Python floats are C doubles. How many, uh, how many uh, significant digits in a C double? Lots, not infinite, 15. So why don't I get 15? That's the stir of the object. Stir gives you 12 digits rather than the 15. That's actually a nice, Nice thing, because it actually helps us avoid the little messy bits at the bottom end of, um, of floating point numbers. In being Pythonic, watch out for floating point numbers. Uh, anyone here good at maths? Who's my maths people? One plus one minus two, anyone, anyone? <laughs> Zero. 1.1 1 .1 plus 1.1 1 .1 minus 2.2, .2. anyone? 0, 0.0, good. Let me give you a harder one. Plus 1.1 1 1 .1 minus 3.3. 0, 0.0, 0. close. <laughs> Look, it's basically zero. <laughs> but it's not zero. So, watch out for floating point numbers. <laughs> that part of the talk, that was just a side, a side uh, no, watch out for floating point numbers. Now, this works, as I can attest, but it's not, it's not a beautiful, this is not Pythonic. 
I need to make it more Pythonic because there's a lot of easy mistakes that I can make in here. Easy mistakes like um, starting at the wrong value. Um, out of bounds, array index out of bounds, at least it'll catch it, but doing a loop with a while is what C programmers do, and this isn't the C talk, this is the Python talk. Um, another interesting thing is that, um, just as a side note, I'm using slicing there. Not all iterables are sliceable. Um, can anyone tell me what uh, one of the built-in core types that's not, uh, container types, that's not sliceable? Yes. Lovely. So this isn't going to work with sets. So this is very unpythonic. It would be much better to have a for loop for I in range. Then I don't need to worry about my initial, I, initial value. While it's less than the, whoops, len of a, I'll be saying whoops a lot. And then I don't need to have the increment. Saving lines creating clearer, better code. And to double check, yes, it still works. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Good. But this is, uh, this is still giving me the problem of that slicing, and what if I don't want to slice? Well, that's not the way we use for loops in Python. If you want to be Pythonic, we don't use for loops with counters. We do the for item in iterable. And if I do the for item in iterable, then I can just add onto it the item. And uh, that gives me an error up because I need to len a there, or lemon a, which is different. That's something else. Plus one. Don't forget about your order of operations. Is That's a syntax error. They're easy. I don't worry about syntax errors. They're just normal. And I didn't need to add because I got the len. And I don't need an extra set of brackets. Cool. Well, this is an improvement, but somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody's going to go and do this. And that's going to give me... <laughs> so programmers go, well, what I'll need to do is that I need to do some error checking. I need to do some error handling. And I'll be doing things like, if the len of that is zero... What am I going to do? Well, the worst possible thing you could do would be print error. <laughs> and that's called coupling and tight coupling. And not every one of the systems that I work on actually have a console. <laughs> uh, I do some embedded work. Some of my clients have embedded work, Python running embedded. We don't have a console. We don't have a screen. So you just can't do a print. And if I'm just going to be really bad, then I'll go and do that as well because I, I can't have programs that just go and crash randomly or just stop working. Although that uh, gives me the behavior I was after. At least give me logging. So next, uh, unpythonic, don't do prints. Print an error, that's an improvement. And import logging. And PS Windows, I am not running as root. But anyway. Well, that's one option that I could do for, uh, for the error checking. I'm not real happy with that. A better option would actually, uh, or another option, would be assert. If you're not familiar with assert, if you're not using assert extensively in your code, I encourage you to use assert. Assert is a really nice way of dealing with logic errors, things that couldn't possibly happen. Although I would debate whether this actually falls into that category. Assert that the len is equal to zero. <laughs> you assert that something be true. Maybe think greater than. 
and I have an assertion error. But this isn't really a logic error. This was a wrong parameter, and I don't know whether assert is the appropriate uh, language construct to use for this. There are lots of other places, preconditions in a function, post conditions in a function. For those, I like assert, but I don't know if this really uh, corresponds to the sort of problem that I want to solve with assert. So let's go back to if and say if the len is zero, ooh, or that's, I don't know what that does. <laughs> if the len is zero, then um, maybe I should uh, go and um, raise an exception. And that's nice, that works. Raises an exception, I could chuck a better error message on the end. And at least that gives the caller the ability to recover from the problem. P.S. that's not a great uh, Pythonic error. Exception is too generic though. I should probably, if I'm going to follow that path, what you should have is a um, not computable, maybe. Extend exception. And you don't actually really actually have to do anything at all there. But at least then I can raise a particular exception that might make more sense to the caller and gives a way of explicitly capturing the right, right return. That's an option. Or, if that's too much effort, why don't I just go and raise a uh, zero division error? <laughs> there we go, that's better. <laughs> Although, actually, that's exactly what it was doing before. <laughs> and so, that would lead me to saying um, the Python Idioms Part 2 Error handling, I've given you some options there, but I would draw your attention to, I was coming at this from a C programmer's perspective, and C programmers do defensive programming. We need to defend our programs against the user, which might actually be another programmer, but in Python, um, EAFP is better than LBYL. So that is, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission versus the kind of programming that I'm currently doing, which is look before you leap, which is de uh, defensive programming. It's Pythonic, because it's easier, to uh, ask for forgiveness. That is, it's easier to wrap the call in a try-accept try block. Sorry, I was doing Java last week. <laughs> Be kind to me. Um, it's easier to wrap it in a try-accept block than ask for permission. Uh, Side note, um, that works really well in Python. It's not a particularly good strategy in personal relationships, and I don't encourage that <laughs> in, in your marriage. Uh, I have from personal experience found that it is, in fact, you get the picture. So coming back to my Pythons, instead of that, maybe I could uh, return a useful value like none. Although that's, uh, that's actually what uh, just a return would do. And there was a great talk yesterday about the monads and the, um, the, uh, the complexity that comes up here with, I normally expect this to give me a float, but sometimes it gives me something that's not a float. So that's not great. I suppose I could um, go and uh, just do a quick little double check. When you do a float, you get the float of something. Can you get the float of a string? Nope. What about infinity? What about not a number? Not a number is really tasty. It's a really tasty piece of um, float. It is actually an, uh, uh, a result of type float. So the type of that is that it's a float. So this, this, uh, this program now always returns a float, and I like that. I'll go and return a float of nan. If I get a space in the right place. And now this always returns a float. Nice thing is floats propagate too. So a square root of not a number is not a number. <laughs> not a number times five is not a number. But it doesn't actually crash and it's still always returning a float. There's some value in that, and that might be a useful one for you to, uh, to know about. Just as a side note, you can also test with uh, math.isnan 
whether you've got NANs. And for those familiar with pandas and NumPy, uh, NANs crop up all the time in those tools. So maybe I can build that into my tool there. There's some value in that. Lovely. Well, sooner or later, someone's going to come along and say numbers is a three. And when my program goes and runs, it doesn't work. So the Java programmers go, oh, we just need to check the type of the arguments. <laughs> now, I've got a little bit of a uh, fuzzy bit going on here about types. And Python has an un uh, a, a little bit of an uncomfortable relationship with types. We are a, um, we are a uh, dynamically typed language, but let me just uh, remind you of the types that we've got. We've got static typing, where the types of the variables is known at compile time, such as in C and Java. <sighs> if I disregard arrays of objects and if I disregard pointers to void and stuff like that. Um, static typing, but not strict. For example, Visual Basic allows us to define the types, including this is a variant type which can change. Dynamic typing, but not strict. Perl, uh, bash. You want a number? I could make that into a number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with generally it works fine and then occasionally it works horribly. Or dynamic typing but strict, which is where Python falls in as a general overall uh, categorization. And we'll refer to this as duck typing. So let me do some duck typing. So the, what I don't want to do is what the Java people, if the type of A is, equal, is not equal, to the type of list, that's not what we want to do. Because I'm nailing it into it must be a list. It's also pretty ugly and slow as well. So instead of that, I could use uh, is instance. If is instance a is of list. That's OK. But what about other things that could be, uh, could be averaged, like, oh, I don't know, something like that? So I could perfectly easily, perfectly desire to average a tuple, but um, a tuple is not a list. So I'm going to shy away from those and say what we've got there is unpythonic. Most of you are familiar with Python? Just checking we're in the right... Uh, you're all still awake? And you all know about the DIR command. DIR to go and um, get item, for example. And I start looking and I find that things like tuples and things like lists have a get item. So, and they also have iterables. So maybe I'll just go and check to see whether there is the particular thing I want. Get item, for example, in the DIR of that object. That'd work. That would check to see whether it's got the behavior that I want. Because when we're talking about ducks, <laughs> were we talking about ducks? Teaching ducks to type takes a while, but it saves you a lot of work afterwards. <laughs> That's not what duck typing is. Duck typing is, I don't care whether it's a duck. I care whether it can quack. I don't care whether it's a list, whether it's a... I don't care about its type. I just care whether it's got the behaviours that I want. Now, one way that I could go and check the duck typing would be with that. That's pretty ugly. Uh, better options would be has atter to see whether it has the attribute. But just remember that in Python... There's no difference, really, honestly, basically, between attributes which are functions and attributes which are data. And you can't tell from DIR which of those are functions and which of those are data. How can I tell which ones are callable? Well, I could find out whether it's got the appropriate attribute, but that doesn't tell me that it's a function. I'd also have to check to see whether it's callable and go and see whether it's... whether uh, uh, a.getItem is callable. 
maybe I'm not interested in whether it's a list because the problem is, is that somebody will come along and create a new list called my list, which will look just like a list, but uh, has some extras. This is, this is inheritance. This is what we do all the time. And I'm a pushy kind of guy. <laughs> so I'll go and uh, push, which of course will just do a self.append that item. Is it a list? Well, it's not a list, but maybe using is subclass would be an appropriate thing to use to find out whether it's subclasses list. Or maybe I could just let it go and crash. <laughs> now, I'm going to leave that bit in there and take a little excursion off and go, there are other kinds of iterables that are iterable which don't have a len. Somebody give me an iterable that doesn't have a len. Dictionaries? Dictionaries have a len and that will tell you how many keys. Good guess. Generators. Sweet. Generators, iterators, all of those sorts of puppies are iterable but they don't have a len. Now I've got myself a nice little um, set of extras here, such as a quick little generator. You want a generator? If you don't know what generators are, that's a generator. <laughs> generator is a clever little piece of uh, trickery that goes and creates an iterable. Uh, being Pythonic, uh, we often use underscore. Some people prefer underscore, underscore. It's much nicer than junk or dummy for an argument that you actually don't really actually need. It's just a way of us. There's nothing special about underscore in that scenario. It's just a, I don't care what it is. I don't need it. I don't use it. And, uh, and then I'm yielding. So that is definitely something that I can iterate through, but it doesn't have a len. So what's the most Pythonic way? So the iterable part of it will work. So if I go and pass a rand rand object, that is a generator to that average function, then pop him up there. I can run it, but it doesn't have a len. So what would be the most Pythonic way of dealing with this? The quick answer is I don't know. <laughs> I'm not the final arbiter on this, but let me give you some options. One way which we would commonly use is build me a list. Build me a list from the generator. Now I've got a list. Now I've got a list. I've got something that's got a len. Now that I've got a len, the average. I wanted that to come up with four. <laughs> but it's different every time. If I keep doing it enough, 13, hmm. But that's building a new list. And that may not be efficient. Now, what's the most Pythonic option here? Well, I could perhaps go and build a list inside here. But if it's already a list, building a list from a list, that would be wasteful. Maybe I could check to see whether it's got a len. If it's got a len, then I don't need to do anything. I can iterate through it and do the len. Um, otherwise, I could uh, build a list from it. I'm just giving you some options there. I don't actually know what the answer is. I could, I could enumerate through it. That would be a nice one. Yep. You get the answer from uh, the, uh, whatever the index reached. Watch out what you start at. Remember that enumerate has a nice handy second argument which will... Um, uh, gives you your start at position. Normally it starts from zero. How do you use a different algorithm? Ah, yeah, yeah. That would be good. Accumulators. Accumulators, yep. I'm actually going to leave that, although I might just um, mention a little bit on if I was creating my own list from scratch, then a uh, collections dot would be useful. Uh, something like collections.iterable would be a nice one. Uh, maybe while you're at it, uh, go and get collections.abc.sized. 
I'm really interested, and I don't actually know because I haven't played with 3.5 yet, but I'm really interested to see how we could get the argument types to implement those interfaces, and that would give me a really nice solution. And so when I get to 3.5, I will redo this talk. Okay. Yep, okay. So that's, uh, that's probably enough of my average function, but um, I've given you some things to think about. While we're talking about Python, let's go and have a look at some other aspects of um, Pythonic design. System design. I'm just putting these here for, for completeness, but um, you should be fairly up on all of these. These are pretty obvious. Similar code, make a function. Um, Cody will correct me if I'm wrong, and apologies, Cody, for insulting you in front of all of these people. But um, when Cody, I think it was his first game, he wrote, um, had a main line of just over 3,000 lines. <laughs> that was quite a program. I hadn't really helped him, and he was doing a, an exercise for Pi Week, the gaming challenge, and um, he hadn't really kind of figured out functions, so he just sort of copied and pasted, copied and pasted, copied and pasted. Um, if I was creating a Pythonic IDE, I would actually remove copy and paste. <laughs> copy and paste is evil. Um, he uh, then got functions and uh, made his program a lot smaller. So Pythonic design, I don't want to see 3,000 line main lines. That's too long. Break it up into functions. If you've got duplicated functions, make a module. These are all straightforward things that I think you should be aware of. Related modules, make a package. But this is Python. Remember the Zen, uh, flat is better than nested. <laughs> I don't want five levels of nesting of packages inside packages inside packages. This isn't Java. If you need a type, make a class. If you've got similar classes, look at inheritance. That was part two. Part three, and the final part, is class design. Um, when you're coming to design classes, like my list, I need to look at what is the data and how does it behave. And I want to emphasize that getters and setters are evil. <laughs> getters and setters are what Eclipse makes Java makes Java programmers do, where every attribute has one getter and one setter, and that's not object-oriented design. That's, certainly it's data hiding, it's, uh, it's hiding the data underneath a layer, but getters and setters are evil. Python has the lovely options of properties, um, the property command, the property decorator, to uh, give you that functionality. Because the general rule in object-oriented design is touch your data as little as possible. That data is precious, and don't you do the work, get somebody else to do it. In other words, one method calls another method. Talking about class design at a high level, we need to consider the three phrases that you'll come across when you start looking at object-oriented design, which is is a, has a, and is like a. These are just useful terms for you to be familiar with, so if I had a class here, a book class, which is actually a specialised kind of a document. Really, a book is a document with an ISBN. And I just threw this in here for Brendan. <laughs> I'll instantiate a object of class book, call it B. So the is a, has a, and is like a, whoa, the B is a book. Is a is instantiation. Has a, a book has a ISBN. A book has a title because it inherited it from document. And is like a, a book is like a document. These sorts of design constructions crop up when you're starting to make patterns. That is design patterns. Now, when people talk about design patterns, they're usually referring to this book, which is whew, a great book, I will say, and it's heavy going. This is, this is hard work. And it's aimed at C++ and Java programmers and building on learning from previous design. I'm not going to recommend that book to you, and I'm not going to recommend the concept even of those design patterns. Um, there are some of the 23 design patterns that that book refers to. 
And the interesting thing is Peter Norvig, one of the, uh, the, the engineers at Google, did a very good paper on design patterns in, Python, in dynamic languages and showed that at least 16 of the 23 are actually no longer necessary because the language supports it like directly. Because the design pattern book is all around the strictures of those languages, C++ and Java. Python has its own patterns. In Python, everything's an object. And functions are easier. Remember that functions are first-class objects. Let me give you a factory and a sorting example. There's a factory. Because a class design is, in fact, an object, you can pass it to a function. Done. That's factories. <laughs> Next. And something like that is just so trivial in Python. If I took the comments out, it's like four lines. Sorting, here you go, this is for my Java friends. <laughs> the sorting example in Java. It's actually a nice design, it's just hard work. Everything in Java is like, <sighs> Sorting in Python is trivial because I, um, I can go and do a sort, although the sorting order that that will give me will probably be not the order that I want. Um, forgive me, Python 3 people, I'm using comp. But um, I could do the same sort of thing with key and uh, creating an anonymous function or an unnamed function, if you'd like, to do the sort. The proper patterns that I'll look at include singletons. Oh, we already have singletons. They're modules. <laughs> so if you've got a, a class that just has static methods, then that's a module. Pop it into a module. Done. Let's look at iterators, adapters, proxies. There it is in C++. <laughs> I ran that um, slide lint program over this presentation. It said, you've gone off the page. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also complained about me using my, in the thanks, it says thanks to my wife, and it wasn't happy about that either. <laughs> Don't tell her. In Java, using an iterator, used to be ugly, now it looks like that. And I'd just like to throw this to you because the Java people even pronounce that, in. <laughs> um, the actual code for a Java iterable implements, and that's where I'm looking at the type hinting helping me out, an inner class, and yes, it's even got a next homage to Python 2. And therefore, an iterator example in Python is trivial. And uh, forgive me again, I'm jumping between two and three here. I've got a three version there. And I do like this. We're actually mixing in that class. An adapter. Adapters, again, there's actually quite a different, uh, quite a lot of selections that I could do here. I've got a B class object, but I want it to have a function one, or I don't want to have it function one. I don't want that pin to fit in anymore. Don't have it. So adapters, again, are trivial in Python. Uh, proxies, this is, I've actually just done this a subtly different way, building an object inside it as opposed to it being one, it being like one. And I'll put all these um, slides up later for those that want to uh, uh, grab them. So marker collection, marker classes like iterable, sized, abstract classes, inheriting from, for example, collection sequence, gives me an abstract class or define the meta class. And Java people, yes, we can do multiple base classes. Which brings me to thanks. My wife, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> and family, um, I want to thank the Python committee um, again for allowing me to have a, have a talk, thank you, um, and to the inspiration for the phrase on being from uh, Brené Brown and Krista Tippett. Okay, we've got about five minutes for questions. Anyone? I have a um, enticement. Every um, every question oh, gets out. a Mr. Happy. We 
hee hee. Yeah. Uh, so what's uh, this is more about plus plus. Uh, oh, okay. Yep. What level? Uh, what level of training do you cater for, to and from? Yeah, uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my background is um, C, C++, so I'm coming from the nasty end, the hard end. Um, I'm actually, the, uh, I run training courses for all sorts of clients, um, everything from non-programmers, which I'm very surprised to find, and I'm hoping that the, uh, the impetus into um, schools means that that part of my job will decay over time. Um, I actually uh, run a whole range of courses, and you can see them at my website, uh, so through to the very advanced sort of end. Uh, yeah, just wanted to point out something with uh, uh, asserts. Yes. Uh, PyTOXC yes, will suppress them. Minus O. Uh, sorry, what did you say, sorry? With the asserts, if you yep. put an assert um, in your code yep. and you PyTOXC it, for, say, a Windows deployment. Ah, yes, 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 yes I'm familiar with PyTOXC. Yeah. And the other thing being aware of is that um, Python minus, ooh, capital O option, optimizes, and that also removes asserts. So asserts uh, have a value, but they also produce a performance penalty because they evaluate them every time. Um, he can have a um, Mr. Happy. Oh, you got one? Um, and minus O, which optimises. It's not quite as good as Scythonizing it. <laughs> minus O, O uh, fully optimises, which just removes doc strings. But yes, it's worthwhile knowing about assert that it's not permanent. <laughs> good, great while you're still testing, though. Hey, Peter, thanks for the talk. Ah, uh, Tom. Yep. So it occurred to me you didn't use many of the, the functional level things, like the yes. sum or... Um, yeah, something. yeah. True. So are they, are they a good consideration? I guess the range, the, the getting the length... Is Absolutely. And um, actually, uh, I, I didn't go into it in here, but I would love to be using or throwing in things like ITER tools a lot in there. Funk tools gives us an enormous range of extra um, simplicity. So um, if you're coming from the readable, sensible, um, then I'd be happy to use those. I, um, I just wanted to ask, do you, is there any recommendations of books or maybe even your own work that you have for somebody that's kind of trying to get their head around the design patterns in Python that's coming from different languages? That's a great question. Um, the quick answer is I don't know of any. Um, I actually got a lot of value out of two books when I first entered this realm. One which was uh, C++ for C programmers, which was actually purely about thinking in objects, um, because that's the conceptual shift. Uh, it's a little interesting in Python because it's pre it, it is in fact a much more object-oriented language than Java, where Java is a terrible mishmash of languages uh, with fundamental primitive types and class types and different rules for them all. So, um, whereas in Python everything's an object, but we still actually program it a lot like a procedural language, which is actually not a great thing. Uh, to quickly answer the uh, question, I don't know of any good Pythonic <laughs> object orientation books, although Nick might know of one. Uh, Mark Summerfield's Python in Practice, the first few chapters are design patterns. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, in purple. Yes. Um, you talked a lot about inheritance. Um, yes. Are there times when you consider composition should be preferred over inheritance? And Good. how does Python, do you feel Python supports that? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I didn't actually get to the composition talk yesterday, which was unfortunate because I wanted to. Um, but I would actually, there are, there are times where it's quite appropriate to do the is subclass. Now, if I'm doing is subclass, composition doesn't help that at all. So the, uh, the, uh, the object-oriented question of is this like one of those as opposed to does this have one of those is the issue. So the one that I had here of um, my book, which was there, yes. It's quite, oh, not that one. Where my book went? There. Um, it's reasonable to say that a book is like a document. There's many similarities in their behaviour. But a, book, a document is not like a title. <laughs> a title is part of its composition. 
So um, the important thing to note there is that a book will stand in at any place where a document would work. So if I've got somewhere where a document would work, because I've inherited from document, I'm like a document, and I can be used anywhere that a document could be used. Um, I could actually do composition and then recode the API or the methods that I want, the interface that I want to get that behavior, but then is subclass wouldn't work. Sir? So, uh, oh, oh, yep. we got one here. Oh, sorry, at Hi, the back. Um, I was just seeking closure on your average function. Can you show us what would be the <laughs> Pythonic way? Um, yeah, look, actually, I will. And this will be a bit, bit, um, a bit unfortunate. So what I would say would be that, <laughs> maybe without so many parens. You know, to be honest, I went on a bit of a journey, but I'm actually quite happy with that. Um, oh, sorry, yes. I, Correct. You know, that's not perfect and there's many deficiencies of that, but I'm actually quite happy with that from a Pythonic perspective because it's actually satisfying the readable. The fact that it crashes, <laughs> if they give it a null length, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, yeah, I Is that about time? Yeah, that's about I'm time. I'm hanging around, so if you've got any more questions or if you'd like a Mr. Happy and you didn't get one, you're welcome to come and get one. Okay. And just before we end, I, we have to do this. It has to happen. Okay. Here is your honorary mug. Lovely. So, thank you. <laughs> give him a round of applause. <laughs>